Welcome everyone from the Arctic to the Antarctic and all around the world for another episode of our Dose of Science. Joining me today, of course, uh, our regulars, Emily Shore, Jonathan Jerry, and we have a very special guest, uh, Dean of Science here at McGill University, uh, Professor Bruce Lennox, who also is a chemistry professor. So he can certainly contribute to our dose of science. So Dr. Lennox, very welcome to, to you. And uh, obviously this has been a year of change at uh, McGill as everywhere else in the world. And uh, looking after this large faculty of science here has been very challenging. So I'd like to start out by asking you how your job basically has been altered during the last year. Um, it's been al altered in two significant one ways. One is it's been literally fast forward uh, for 11 months now. Uh, we, we are presented with making, developing strategies, uh, testing them in a think tank sort of way, and then implementing them in days, where, whereas we might have been, been taking months or longer to do that. So everything's very fast. Um, I think that the, the reason why, why it, it's been a terrible year, but it hasn't been a terrible year for us, uh, because we found a new way of working. Uh, uh, we have great people in the university, every university does, but my goodness, uh, people have come forward. We have incredible teams now. Uh, the nature of universities is, you know, every professor is an entrepreneur uh, in, in many ways. They teach their courses, they do their research, but we found a, a new way of working that uh, is, to me is really invigorating. Uh, it, it can be exhausting at the pace, but uh, you know, it's, we've, I, I'd say that that we've done remarkable things um, with, because we have a remarkable people. I think uh, online teaching, of course, uh, has been the way way to go. And uh, uh, th there are obviously pluses and minuses. Uh, in, I know that, you know, for myself, I mean, I'm kind of used to this because teaching very, very large courses, we've been used to recording lectures uh, anyway. Uh, but I do find a, a difference in, in terms of, of, of kind of the atmosphere of speaking into the computer uh, as opposed to being in, in the lecture room. And uh, you don't get the, the, the feedback. I, th I think that the, the material is delivered very, very effectively. And, you know, we get certainly very good feedback from, uh, from the students, uh, but it still is, is, is not the same. I, I think it's effective, certainly in teaching, uh, but there is, the atmospheric uh, challenge, yeah. you know, that yeah. that somehow we have to solve. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're 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 really, uh, I'd say, we we continue to grapple with this. Um, I haven't heard often enough the difference between live live music and and recorded music in terms of the experience. And I think we, you know, uh, those of us who who like live, you know, going to concerts of of any type. Um, you, you, you leave the concert hall and you say, I'm not going back back home and you know, listening to recordings. That, that, was, that was something special. And, and I, I think students, uh, professors, everyone are, are really realizing that. Um, we're great at delivering content, but so is recorded music, right? Uh, but it doesn't have the spirit. No, it's the it's the correct analogy, and uh, like Emily and I have talked about this often because we're both Broadway uh, aficionados. Oh, I'm sorry and, to hear uh, that. Go, going to, <laughs> to to watch a Broadway show live uh, is very different from watching it on 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 the screen, even though you see it better on the screen. Like the I would say the production of Hamilton that we uh, yeah. uh, can now watch. It's, it's, it's excellent. I mean, you see the facial expressions, you see everything. All the different angles also. Uh, yes, yes. And, uh, but somehow it's still not the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, our, our, 
we're 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 in the business of of providing an environment for students to learn, and part of that is teaching. But I think everyone really recognizes that content is is a key component, a pillar, but it's not the entire learning experience. Well, it's, it's kind of if you actually make the analogy to restaurants, because you could get food, we could order the food, but the rest of the experience that comes with it, the ambiance, you know, the fun, that's what I say. I mean, we, you can't Uber eats ambiance, right? So um, it's the same, Joe and I discussed this pre-COVID because like I, like he said, the world of chemistry courses and Joe's been teaching online forever. Students, I think, probably retain their content better when it's recorded because you can also rewind. I remember if I was a student and I was stuck on a, what did he say? What did, they, what did she say? You just rewind and you listen again. But so in terms of the content acquisition, it's probably very good, but, or yes, probably very good. But in terms of the experience and all the other they get, that. That cannot be obtained just from customers. one thing I can I can add from experience is that when we first started uh, recording lectures, the lines outside my office before exams disappeared because they just kept going over over back and forth until they they got it. So it's you know, not what works, but much more challenging. Uh, Dr. Lennox, if you can comment on this, is the laboratory experience. Yeah. Well, um, we've uh, we've been unable to do it in a very effective way. We 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 have had really interesting uh, substitutes uh, uh, in terms of the processes of laboratory science. We've had some really ingenious online experiments that have been developed. But um, you know, years and years ago, I've been at McGill for thirty four years. Uh, I started to ask students when. They were in my introductory organic chemistry class. Like, what's, what, what draw, drew, what draws you to science? Why? Because you know, at, at McGill we have, we have incredible students, um, and they're not in, in history because they couldn't do science in high school. They're not in English because they couldn't do math in high school. It's because they want to do English. And I would ask students like, what's in science? They always would say, I really want to do science. I, I want to. I want to do the labs, um, and I think the engagement, the really big gap that our students in science are experiencing is that they're not, they're not getting that in element of engagement uh, with the labs. Uh, we will uh, address that when we get back to uh, a new state of uh, some form of normal. Uh, but it's a really, it's. Um, Laboratory science is very social too. Uh, what, what are some yeah. of the solutions that you have enacted during the pandemic to sort of as a kind of like a stopgap measure? Well, we've had uh, in some courses because of the density issues, uh, uh, person density, uh, we've, we've, we've had sort of intermittency. So uh, instead of having 13 weeks of labs, we've had a couple of courses where uh, every student gets, I think four weeks um, and then uh, remote uh, labs in 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 the others, uh, but for the most part, we've 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 just suspended them, and uh, we will be expecting students to, uh, you know, come in and do the laboratory parts of courses uh, when we return. Uh, for the advanced courses, because they are smaller, uh, we have been able to hold uh, a fair number of those. Uh, throughout both the fall and now the winter semesters. And the response from students, especially in the chemistry ones, has been really, really strong. Yeah, I think <clears throat> it's important to point that out, that that our students who are going to forge careers in, in, in chemistry and who actually need the laboratory experience, I mean, they need to know how to use a, a GC mass spectrometer. They're not... Uh, um, they're not being forgotten. I mean, they, they are getting that experience. It's, it's more the question of, you know, in, in organic one, where you have this very large class, they're not getting the laboratory experience, but let's face it, you know, the world is not going to come to an end if they don't do a distillation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but uh, we, we are certainly getting uh, it all done for the students for whom it really matters. Right. Yeah. But, you know, you're absolutely right, Joe. Uh, I'd say that the the gap that I'm most concerned about is um, uh, when we're teaching, um, especially at the 
first year or two in, in science, uh, we're, we're talking about resolved problems. Uh, we're, we're talking about the path to which a problem has been resolved. Uh, that's how we present science to students. But th th that is no substitute for going in and finding that something doesn't work. Uh, uh, you know, the textbook, textbook problem done in the laboratory, done by 100 students, you'll have a distribution of about 30 or 40 different results because there's it's the nature of you know the stochastic nature of experiments they you know not every and that's taking the human element out so students to me it's so important that we teach students the skills in which to do experiments but that what they're doing is an experiment and not a demonstration and the nature of online experiments is that they almost de facto are demonstrations. So um, I, I hope that we can uh, get into that mindset too. Uh, you know, problem solving, troubleshooting of why an experiment gave an unexpected result is really the exciting part of science. Well, the ultimate lab experience, of course, is a research. And since uh, you also do that, of course, you still direct research, even though you sure. have this uh, full-time job of, of being dean. I don't know how you fit it all in, but you still have a research group and you're, you're doing research. So how has that um, worked out during the pandemic? Well, <clears throat> we've uh, university-wide, but especially in the Faculty of Science, uh, we've gone to the principles of safe distancing um, and the principles of, of um, uh, need. So when we started to do an audit of our close to thousand graduate students in the Faculty of Science and, and postdocs, um, we learned quite quickly that there actually is a very large fraction of those researchers who uh, are in the laboratory socially and physically, but their work is computational. Um, a, a gigantic number, uh, and not just in the obvious departments of, or disciplines like mathematics or computer science, but it's also in, in chemistry and in physics and biology. So we, um, those, those people have been, many of them have not been on the campus since March the 11th, 2020. Uh, and the students and researchers who, whose research requires ongoing laboratory work. Uh, we've had uh, 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 shifts, like in chemistry, the shifts I think are from nine to three and from 3.30 till 10.30 at night. Um, and students have stayed in their bubble, you know, amazing discipline, self-discipline among, among these students. Uh, seven day weeks, but people aren't working seven days, uh, thankfully, but um, we've, the research enterprise has been sustained. It hasn't been enlarged, uh, but people are, are getting pretty pretty anxious. They want to get in uh, because research is, 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 a, is a social endeavor too. You have to talk to people. You have to share, share your successes and failures on that, that day with your colleagues. Uh, it, it's actually become quite a lonely enterprise for our students and postdocs. Um, there might be two or three people in a lab that would normally hold 12 to 15 at any time just to maintain the, the conditions. Because as you know, uh, you know, a laboratory is, uh, is not static. Uh, uh, the analogy I've, I've used in the university to uh, non-science non people is that uh, there's, there's your, your kitchen at home where you're, you're, you're making your dinner for yourself. And then there's a hotel kitchen um, where you have 15 or 20 people and you have a couple of fires going on. It's called cooking, I guess. And you have some excitement and you have some people throwing knives around. And that's much more of what a research lab is in terms of busyness, people all moving all the time. And that just doesn't work in safe distancing uh, conditions. Let's share possible. some of your uh, successes. Uh, over the years, because I'm sure that when you first started uh, here at McGill, your research program was quite different from what it is now, right? You, you, yes, never, you never know 
where it is going to lead. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you started with what what particular area of uh, research? Well, um, oddly enough, given the current conditions, my my principal area was in biosensors, developing electrochemical biosensors. So I had worked uh, before I came to to McGill on uh, the, the the background technology for uh, the most widely used glucose sensor in the world, electrochemical glucose sensor. Um, I was a minor part of a very large team uh, in the UK. I brought the concepts and things that I wanted to, to do in that space combined with organic chemistry because I'm trained as an organic chemist. And so I've um, one thing led to another in the sense uh, that um, you know, you you read you read what other people are doing. You have really strong students who are uh, clever students who are doing things that they tell you about after they've done it, um, rather than asking your permission to do it. Um, and uh, so, you know, I've evolved into quite quickly into at that time was the new area of nanoscience um, of making structures, making materials that are you know, one to 15 nanometers in size, different properties. Uh, it was like a new, a new area of chemistry in the late 80s and, and 90s. And now it's, it's still new, but it's uh, very, um, uh, there are two, three, four generations of scientists now who have uh, been, been advancing it. And of course, uh, nano plays a very important role right now in both the Moderna uh, uh, vaccines and the Pfizer vaccines because of the delivery system, right? Which are based on uh, nanolipid particles. So what, what does that actually mean? Well, you know, uh, what they were seeking was a, uh, a vehicle to, uh, to actually present the, uh, 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 the derivatives, the, 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 the protein derivatives that would elicit uh, an antibody response. So you need a carrier that is, is not a, uh, a, a, a viral capsid. You need something that's inert, that is uh, non-toxic, can, um, can be metabolized. And we have, as you write a lot about, uh, Joe, we have, we, I don't know the percentages, you probably know, but we've got a lot of lipids. Some of us has too much, so much some of us have too much lipid. Uh, uh, but, um, you know, when you combine that, you have a, a, a very safe and inert, um, but, but also a very capable uh, carrier. Uh, it's very, very clever what these people have done. Uh, very, very clever. And of course, McGill has been, you know, uh, certainly our researchers have been very interested in, in COVID and many, many aspects of that. Absolutely. So where, what contributions has McGill made in this in the whole COVID world? I haven't tr tracked all the details, but as I know that within the Faculty of Science, we've had some people who have made some tremendous uh, contributions. Uh, uh, in the present day, uh, you know, we had we had a number of people, especially in chemistry, who just literally stopped everything that they were doing, and redirected themselves to uh, to these types of problems. So uh, Nick Mortessier in chemistry, uh, he's been very very active. Uh, Masad Dama as well, you know, a world 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 class, world famous uh, nucleotide nucleoside chemist. Um, uh, Masad and his team and his research group team have been involved with eight other research groups. They made a consortium almost overnight it last March uh, to develop a uh, made, in, made in Canada diagnostic. Um, because as you know, the, the, uh, the, di the, uh, the, the, the diagnostics that are, are being used using PCR, um, they're, they're very constrained in terms of the, the supply chain of the reagents. So they, they set out to create a made in McGill, made in Canada um, uh, test, and they've been successful. I don't know the status of it um, going further, but um, it's, it's performed very, very well. Um, but, you know, if we look historically, uh, you know, I spoke of, of uh, uh, Dr. Dama, but, you know, he, uh, he did his PhD at McGill uh, under Kelvin Ogilvie. And 
you know, much of what's being done right now could not have, uh, could not be foreseen um, without the, the ability to actually uh, make DNA and RNA in the lab uh, for, uh, for research purposes. And that was done, done here at McGill, invented here. Well, the world's first functioning gene machine sits outside of my office. Exactly. Right? And exactly. I, I look at it uh, and admire it uh, basically every day. And this was uh, uh, Kelvin Ogilvie's uh, brainchild. And uh, at that time, it was a huge breakthrough. I mean, I, I think they managed to put together 20 or so nucleotides, yeah, yeah. something, something like right. that, yeah, yeah. Uh, which and was quite a breakthrough at that time. Uh, and, and I believe that they subsequently uh, 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 synthesized the first uh, in-lab synthesis of RNA. Um, Yes, two, and, and, two three uh, years later, Kelvin went on to become a senator in, in right. Canada. So yeah. he's he's brought a lot of uh, honor to McGill. You know, the, the, the political that, type, not the hockey type. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 You know that he was on my PhD oral, uh, Kelvin. Oh, oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So that goes back a, a long Just time. A few years ago. <laughs> yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a. A couple of years, uh, a couple of yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, but you know, you know McGill's. You know, uh, it's uh, this is there's this current uh, uh, avant-garde uh, term of uh, you know traceability. Well, I think it's a really interesting exercise for your your listeners to uh, trace the Moderna and these people. They did not wake up one morning and say, uh, "We we can we can make a vaccine." Like the 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 pyramid, and they have they have done an incredible job, but you know they're at the top of a pyramid of a vast amount of necessary work that, at the very least, has thirty years in its making. All um, the building the building blocks were were yeah, there. All the building blocks. You know, uh, Isaac Isaac Newton, who was by all accounts not a nice man, and pretty much of an egotist, but one day he was asked. How do you know that, Joe? I was there. <laughs> one day, PAC uh, oral, Joe. <laughs> one day he was asked uh, how he had so many ideas, good ideas, and he said, "Because I stood on the shoulders of giants." Okay. So he gave credit to all the people who went on before him, and th this is how research works. Uh, you know, it's uh, always a communal effort, but there usually will be one person who says, "Uh huh." You know, there's that one moment where you go off in a different direction, where you notice something that someone else uh, didn't uh, notice. Well, that's, that's the collaborative research that Dr. Lennox was just talking about yeah. that's missing right now, yeah. that human element. Yeah. yeah. Almost all and, breakthroughs start with someone saying, isn't that interesting? And then it, it goes on from there. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And and there are there's a there's a subset of of our colleagues. Uh, um, I'm not in this subset who who have an incredible skill at at seeing connections, um, and often the connections are are between events or reports or mm -hmm. ideas in quite different types of fields, um, and it's it means that they've read a lot. It means that they're watching a lot, but there's a lot of these aha moments in modern science are realizing that what's happened in astrophysics is actually uh, being seen in cell biology in terms of say a measurement. Um, and there, 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 there are amazing people who, who see the connections, test them and then exploit them. What is also befuddling to us though, in the area that we are in dealing with, you know, trying to separate the sense from nonsense, is how we sometimes find accomplished scientists or physicians <clears throat> who have just gone off the track and, and who are just not abiding by, by the science, but uh, have yeah. various views for vested interest or for whatever reason, or, 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 or just are not evaluating the evidence properly. And it's really hard to understand how sometimes you can have people who are tremendously educated and accomplished in one area and yet um, will yeah. make completely unsubstantiated statements uh, about science. It's 
Well, you know, I, 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 ob I observe what you study um, uh, very often. I'm not a student and the way that, that you are of, of these states. And if you, if you uh, parse out the, the, the psychology of the problem or maybe the pathology of what you're describing, um, there, are, um, there are aspects of science that are, are really difficult. And, you know, there are people who who have tackled a really hard problem that requires constant work and observation for 20 and 30 and 40 years. Incredible dedication. There are problems that just require that of a person. Um, it's pretty easy when you've invested 40 years in something to also see or to recognize that maybe some of the thing that sustains that is dogma. Uh, you have to start believing that you're going to get somewhere to, 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 to be on that hike for 40 years um, or paddling for 40 years. You, 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 you need, you need not, a little bit more than just scientific intuition. And I think dogma is often the origin of what what you're describing, Joe, is that people need to believe it in order to sustain themselves. Yeah. But sometimes and they can't take it away. You yeah. know, even Nobel Prize winners, I mean, we talk of something called the Nobel disease, you know, where Nobel Prize winners all of a sudden become yeah. experts in everything, usually yeah. in the eyes of others. But you have people like Luc Montagnier, Nobel yeah. Prize winner, uh, who has gone into homeopathy and yeah. believes that non-existent molecules can have an ex existing effect. It's, it's very hard to understand how this happens, but it, it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Humans are yeah. an amazing species. Right? Well, I think it's, and what, what I assign that to sometimes is that um, not everyone passed freshman chemistry. <laughs> not every Nobel Prize winner uh, uh, passed freshman physics. Um, yeah. and, I suspect uh, that Luc Montagnier did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, do you think that any of the, the stuff that, that uh, uh, we've had to, to kind of uh, change to and, and now we use and, and COVID, you know, the remote uh, presentation, all of this, how much of this is going to stick once we sort of solve the problem of COVID? Oh, I, I hope a lot of it sticks. Um, and, um, you know, as, as, as difficult and often terrible as it's been, the length of time that, that we would have not, nothing would have stuck if this had lasted for three months because it would have been a phase, it would have been a season, it would have, we're, we're into a year and we're going to come out of this probably at a year and a half time. So there are a lot of people that, you know, that they, they know that there's stuff that's working well for them. I, this, this, this Zoom thing, this video conferencing thing is, uh, um, it, 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 it's, it's, inc it's so interesting as to how it's allowing people to, to interact. It's, it's reversing, uh, you know, the uh, uh, introvert extrovert um, dichotomy that, that, as, a, as instructors, as professors, we so often uh, experience with students, uh, it's very d democratizing. Um, it's bringing forth people uh, right, right into our faces who would be sitting in the back of a class yeah. and, and never coming up to us, never asking a question. Um, so I think, I think, uh, I think we, we should right now, like at this pause before, as we anticipate the vaccine, I think we should do a real cataloging personally and then collectively as to um, what we're not going to go back to. Uh, I like to put it in the positive term as what we're gonna keep and what we're doing. And can you see us going to American Chemical Society meetings with 10,000 other chemists the way that we have been doing before? I think that's just not going to happen. And no. uh, because of safety or because of like desire to just travel and hotel and expenses. I think all of the above and because it just works so well on, on online. 
Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually the chair of a international conference um, in a moment of insanity. I agreed to do this six years ago, but it's this summer in Montreal. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we have a great organizing committee. Uh, it's the IUPAC World Chemistry Congress. Uh, but uh, about uh, six weeks ago, we made the decision to go virtual. And now we're uh, you know, planning for that. Um, what, what it's a little bit like what we're dealing with in, in the education space is to how do we create a, a, an experience that's meaningful. Um, what I see, Joe, to, to go to your question, I see that we'll have um, a 10,000 person conferences, but that we'll have uh, salons uh, distributed around the world, uh, maybe in real time, where three, 400 people in Minneapolis and in you know, 600 in New York and 150 in Montreal will actually have the social um, uh, aggregation of, of the conference. Maybe they'll come from across Ontario and Quebec to Montreal. Um, and we'll have the very important personal social aspect of these conferences. But I see, I actually see no need uh, at all to, to, to go to uh, having a conference center for a week and having 25 parallel talks. Um, it's, it's, uh, we did it because that was, that's what was available. But it was, it was never especially good. But I really wonder how that's going to impact people socially. I mean, we know how to socialize because we're adults, but there are, you know, five-year-olds who in 20 years would be going to these conferences and then they're just going to log on Zoom, you know, or meet with a much smaller group if they do something in person. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to know these, these longitudinal effects for a long time. Yeah. But we're going to have to work really hard at, at having um, uh, interactive experiences that are meaningful. Um, and, and again, uh, you know, when I, when I describe the introvert or introvert ex extrovert dichotomy, um, you know, conferences bring uh, a young, uh, inexperienced, sometimes naive, certainly often terrified uh, student into the space that's occupied by Nobel Prize winners and professors. And, you know, it happens because the student turns around and finds the Nobel Prize winners standing behind them in the coffee line. So they talk. Um, so we have to we have to work really hard. But I, th I think I think we can be very creative about this, too. I don't think we've uh, we, we've 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 exploited the unintended consequences of many of our structures that we've set up uh, in terms of meeting, especially. And let's let's examine what were the unintended consequences, and let's try to actually make them intentional. Uh, I'll give you a little to when when I was in grad school, went to a, a conference. It was a CIC conference at that time. It was in Ottawa, and Linus Pauling was the the keynote speaker, and it was in the ballroom, and I, there must be a thousand people there, and he gave his talk at that time of course he was already on the vitamin c kick and he gave his talk about vitamin c and uh, i remember he showed a graph and it was increase in sales of vitamin c and reduction in heart disease and reduction in cancer and even at that time, I remember I was a little bit confused <laughs> about this. I mean, of course, I wouldn't have dared to say anything to this God who had come down to, to, to lecture to us. But there he was uh, talking, uh, you know, this guy who had written the classic textbook on, on, on the covalent bond, who, who basically had the structure of DNA before Crick and, and Watson, he, you know, almost. And... Um, having published hundreds of proper peer-reviewed scientific papers, and here he was talking about his own anecdotal evidence and, you know, showing this to, to a thousand people. But nobody said anything because yeah. this was <laughs> Linus Pauling. But uh, I always remember that, the classic difference between association and cause and effect relationships. Yeah. Joe, yeah, it's funny. I'll, I'll tell you about my first conference experience. So it was at the Royal York Hotel, 
in Toronto. Uh, I was a graduate student in Toronto, but that year the chemistry conference in Canada happened to be uh, in Toronto at the Royal York. So I was late in the day because that's when students were scheduled to speak. It was probably four or five in the afternoon. So it was all set up, uh, unbelievably nervous, but uh, every word scripted for my 20, my 19 and a half minute talk and 30 seconds of questions. And as I <laughs> went to the microphone, there was this very loud honky tonk piano that started to play in the room next door to me. So no matter how loud I spoke into the microphone, no one could hear me and actually no one cared what I was saying because they were very interested in why there was someone playing a piano next door. <laughs> so finally, the uh, it was the last talk of the day, the, uh, the uh, very uh, pleasant uh, uh, host stood up and said, uh, Mr. Lennox, maybe it's best that we, um, that you share your ideas uh, 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 elsewhere, maybe in the hallway, because I don't think you're gonna be able to compete with the honky tonk. <laughs> maybe I should have taken that as an omen. <laughs> uh, no, if I remember right, I think um, Dave Ariel and I, I think we did a, a chemistry magic show at that conference, which was at the Royal York. Do you remember what would that have been? It would have been, uh, 19, um, it would have been 1980 or yeah. 80 or 81. Very, very possible. Anyway, in, interesting. Okay, let, let's... Uh, uh, wait, 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 wait. You don't play the honky-tonk piano, I do you? I don't play the honky-tonk piano. Okay. Does David? Have, no, but, but Ariel does, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're, you're off, but I... I... Uh, Jonathan, I mean, we were talking about working from home and whether or not, you know, it's socially isolating. I mean, you, you have been doing this now for, for a year. Have you yeah. had a problem? Uh, I wouldn't say I have a problem. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's been good for me. Um, and I mean, of course, I'm saving an hour each day in, you know, not having to go to McGill and come back home. Uh, but it's, I mean, it, it does become a little isolating at times. And I, I've, I've, I was listening to a podcast and, uh, you know, one of the hosts is very outgoing. And for him, from the beginning, this was very, very difficult because he's so used to these social situations. Whereas the person he was interviewing is much more of an introvert like myself. And But even that person was saying, you know, now that it's been a year, I'm starting to feel it. I can only imagine what it was like for you and how what it's been for the past year as an extrovert. So, you know, I, I do think that, you know, there's there, I, I'm looking forward to things going back to some version of normal because, yeah, it, it does become a little uh, monastic uh, at times, yeah. Okay, uh, one last topic that I would like to talk about here is how the university has been affected financially by this because um, the way that uh, funding is here in Quebec, a lot of uh, money comes from the province uh, as a direct result of the number of students that, that we have and the courses that we teach. So how has this uh, affected the university? Well, um, I'm, 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 I'm not an expert on the detail, Joe, uh, but I do get uh, uh, you know, regular reports as all do, deans do from, uh, from our provost. Um, so uh, you're, you're absolutely right. 78% of, of our revenue at the university uh, derives from student enrollment. And that can be the tuition, uh, and the government grant, and the government grant is linked to to our enrollments. Um, so uh, there have been a couple of of, of um, sectors uh, in the university that uh, have uh, not been able to 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 maintain the same enrollment. Uh, but I think it's very much the minority. The faculty of science. Um, We've had, you know, we, we worked very hard to, uh, to, uh, to communicate to our incoming students, both returning but new students, that this is what we were going to do. It's limited. We're working hard. Uh, 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 please engage with us. So we, in the fall, we were at, I think, 103% of our target enrollment. And uh, this January, I think it's now 107% um, of... Uh, I mean, there are various reasons. Uh, one is very easily understood is what else is a student going to do? Uh, you know, a gap year doesn't doesn't really work if it means, you know, spending the gap year in, in your mom's basement in Moose Jaw. Um, uh, so 
you know, students have engaged uh, uh, remotely and uh, you know, many of them are in Montreal. So that aspect has been um, very strong through people's really hard work. And I really want to emphasize the, the January uh, enrollment. If it didn't work in the fall, if it was not a good academic experience, uh, we could have gone to 60% because students could say, oh, I'll, I'll check in next year. Uh, but they didn't. The, we, there were many challenges for students, the isolation, the difference, changes in workload um, that, that were arising because of the remote. But I tell you the responses that I've personally had unsolicited from students are just eye-watering, uh, like fantastic, fantastic experience. I can't believe how hard people have worked. Uh, uh, I learned so much. Um, those students would not have, have re-enrolled in January if, uh, if, they, if they had other experiences. Um, what, what I have from reports from the provost is that um, uh, there, there have been reduced costs because there have been very few people on the campus at any time. So it leads to a change in costs. But we've also lost a considerable revenue stream through food services and residences, et cetera. And they balance within like 10%. Um, so uh, we heard at Senate this week that the provost is projecting a, a, a deficit this year, operating deficit of, I believe it's in the order of $13.5 million, which is, I believe, something in the order of six, six or $7 million more than was projected before this mess started. Uh, that's just like astoundingly incredible. Uh, when there are Australian universities that are projecting uh, seven, eight, and nine hundred million dollar deficits for this year, um, University of British Columbia was projecting a deficit of two hundred and thirty-five million. They've now revised that to a hundred million, one hundred million dollar deficit, um, and we're talking something in the order of thirteen. Uh, it's been about you know lots of prudent measures, but, uh, but not, you know, the thing that, that I'm so proud of this university is, is that um, people have come to the fore when they've been able, not everyone can contribute uh, in the remote sense, but, but, but the university continues to, employ, to, to support all of its employees. Well, talk um, about contributing come to our last point here because uh, McGill has a very special day called McGill 24 mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. this is all about contributing yeah. so who, who is being asked to contribute and okay yeah for what reason yeah so the McGill 24 started in 2015 and it's a 24-hour fundraising blitz uh, that occurs uh, principally online uh, through different social media platforms and its primary intention is to engage, uh, to engage our 275,000 alumni around the world and our countless supporters who aren't alumni and our own students and our own staff and our own faculty. So it's um, over that 24 hour period, there are people who are manning phones if people want to phone in. So it's, 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 it's you know, it's an avant-garde telethon. Uh, but my understanding is, is that we were, I think the first in Canada to do it. It's raised over $9 million. Yeah. Um, and so much of it is about, you know, a group in Hong Kong of alumni, they have, they have a competition with a group of, of uh, alumni in San Francisco that, you know, the ones to raise the most money in, in the next hour, uh, that it'll be doubled and it'll be matched. Uh, this year, the Faculty of Science has set uh, two priorities uh, for the funds that come in. Uh, the first is uh, student mental health, uh, supporting student mental health. We need, we need to bring in resources that people. Uh, we need. We have a great, great advising group, a great wellness officer, but we need to create more programs to make sure that students can make contact with with people who can help them if they're if they're having challenges. Um, so student mental health. 
And uh, the other aspect is bursaries. So bursaries are not scholarships. Scholar, you know, I view it that every student who has managed to meet our ridiculously high uh, academic cutoffs to, to get to McGill, um, I view every student as being a scholarship student, but we don't have, we can't offer a scholarship to every student, but 30% of our students in a normal year have financial needs because we don't admit students based on their ability to pay. Um, we want to make sure that every student that gets accepted comes to Montreal and to McGill. And so there's a good support network. But this is a very special year because you can probably count on two hands of our 5,000 students in the Faculty of Science who actually had a summer job last year. Where would they have had a summer job? You know, around the world, there were, nothing was open, to, you know, plus or minus a few uh, uh, fast food places. So we're going to have a tremendous bursary need for our students because they will probably now have perhaps two summers where they will not have had an opportunity to make the five, six, seven thousand dollars per summer that they normally would. So this is a huge issue with me um, because it will break my heart to uh, to read, and I will be reading if students say I can't return to McGill because I. I simply can't get the financial resources uh, because of this situation. And these students can be in Montreal too. It's not, they don't have to be in Vancouver or, or you know, uh, around the world. So McGill 24 is a great opportunity for people to give $25, $100, $5 uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, we get all that, um, but it's, um, it's, it's really, it's, and it's also fun because there's a lot going on on the website. Well, so I'd really like people to check it out. Another reason why McGill is at the top of the academic uh, pyramid in, in Canada, <clears throat> and I think that we have um, met a lot of the challenges posed by uh, COVID. Yeah. We've learned a lot, uh, developed some methodologies that are going to stay with us for forever. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, COVID hasn't been totally bad. <laughs> Obviously, we'd rather no. not have the situation, but, but uh, I, I think that we have uh, been able to milk it for, you know, some uh, results that, that are turning out to be uh, very good. And hopefully, if we talk again uh, sometime next year, yeah, uh, I'd love to have uh, uh, a different take on things because uh, by that time the vaccines hopefully will have kicked in, yeah. and we may get back to some degree of normalcy. Although I think it it will be forever a different world. We will, you know, uh, I think the the mask uh, business is is going to be with us for for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, we just have to accept that uh, things are going to be different and we'll deal with it. Yeah, I think I so. Want to, I just want to mention, because we didn't, we talked about Miguel 24, but the day <laughs> to yes. actually contribute is March 10th. That's right. And uh, like Dr. Lennox said, if you donate to the Faculty of Science, your dollars will be going towards student bursaries and or student mental health. Um, mm -hmm. And I know the faculty also has some matching programs. So if, you know, if you donate 25, then someone could donate 25, it, it, it's level. Right. So right. um, you'll see it everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you can choose between you can choose between either of those or you can designate it to something that interests you if you if you graduated from the Department of Psychology and they have a great student club mm -hmm. if you want to say I'd like it, you can designate it I guess is the term uh, uh, forever where you want your 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 gift to um, to, to, to land um, exactly. That's category three in the the form, I believe. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for all of that. And uh, remember the, the Nobel disease so that if you ever do get the Nobel Prize, yeah, uh, yeah. you want to make sure you stick in just in, in your, your area. Uh, yes. so, uh, Thank you. Thank it's you, been Joe. Very, uh, Is there a vaccine for that, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, unfortunately, there's no vaccine against ignorance. I wish that there was. You know, this is we we talk with Jonathan and Emily and, and Ada about this all the time. Is is what can we do in order to make people see the light? And um, 
uh, sometimes it is indeed uh, frustrating. Well, Jonathan, has, Jonathan has a great article this week about how to talk to a conspiracy theorist. This week or the previous week, Emily? This is the previous week. <laughs> yes, it's on our website. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So uh, thanks again, um, uh, Dean Lennox, for uh, chatting with us, bringing us up to date on, uh, on all of this. And uh, we'll check in uh, in a few months again when uh, hopefully we'll be in an even better situation. Yeah. Thanks thank you. It's great thank to you. talk to you all. And thanks everyone for uh, listening and watching. And we'll be back with you, Emily, when? In two weeks. In two weeks' time. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Remember, always take a dose of science. <laughs>